Roberts. Uh, I'm Nicole Biggert. I'm a Dean of the Graduate School of Management at uh, UC Davis, and I'm going to moderate um, this session. Um, we're going to, we've, we've talked uh, uh, this morning about challenges. We've talked about um, uh, some of the, the uh, uh, possibilities uh, that the current economic uh, and political moment uh, gives us. We've talked about different ways we can stimulate the economy or, uh, what was, Fred, what's your, your new term? Stimulate the economy. We're going to <laughs> uh, stimulate through innovation. Um, that's uh, that's the new word, and it's already slipping. Um, uh, but we now have the opportunity with uh, this this panel to to talk about, um, given all of our ideas, how do we how do we put it all back together? Overcoming pol overcoming political and economic obstacles. Can the U.S. create a world class innovation system? How how can we go about taking what we know and who we are and um, not this is certainly not a tabula rasa, but but there there is uh, there is a possibility during uh, during a period of crisis to to perhaps do things that you can't do when when forces are stable. That uh, the the chaos is a good time to um, to try to uh, mush, uh, move the system uh, forward. Um, and so we will. That's what we're going to consider uh, now. What 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 can we do? Um, our panel today, or this, this afternoon, is um, uh, Bob Birdall. Bob is the president of the American Association of Universities, and if you, if you don't know what that is, it's sort of the club of the top research universities in the U.S. Is that about, what, 63? 62. 62. 62 uh, um, Universities. So much of what we talked about universities today and their role in in stimulating innovation through research. These are the these are the universities that uh, Bob represents, and they uh, those presidents and chancellors uh, meet together to to let their um, their wills be known. Um, so you, I'm sure we can certainly ask uh, Bob about the role of the AAU in this. Um, he was uh, uh, pr uh, prior to this chancellor of the University of California, Berkeley from 1997 to 2004, and before that, president at the University of Texas, Austin. And by, uh, by academic training is a historian, and so presumably has the long view in mind at all, at, at all times. Um, uh, our second speaker is Ron Hira. Uh, Ron is an a assistant professor of public policy at uh, Rochester Institute of uh, Technology. He's also uh, uh, an engineer, and he's written uh, Outsourcing America, uh, which really deals with work fit, workforce issues in high-tech industries, including uh, issues of immigration related to some of the things we were just uh, talking about. So um, part of any solution will will uh, in moving forward in innovation will have imp implications for um, high-tech workforce, and uh, Ron will be our expert on that. Sean O'Rean is professor of sociology at the National University of Ireland, and Sean has done a lot of work on, on uh, public policy and stimulating what's been truly an incredible transformation of, uh, of Ireland. Um, uh, they, they've put together a, a very global, uh, uh, their global node in, uh, in in, uh, in industrial systems um, uh, of a number of companies, but partic particularly IT telecommunications firms. They're also suffering, as we are, with the downturn, and I'm sure uh, Sean will have some, uh, some things to tell us about, uh, about building, a, building a, uh, an industrial policy, oops, she can't say, innovation policy, um, and, uh, and, and what, how, how one, Looks for uh, building one that will will last through all kinds of uh, of uh, ups and downs. And then finally, uh, Mark Stanley. Mark is the director of technology innovation program at the U.S. Department of Commerce, um, and served as director uh, serves as director of the Advanced Technology Program since 2003. Is very deep roots in in um, in government policy. Um, uh, regarding uh, technological commercialization, and he also holds a law degree. There are m several people talking about uh, patents and uh, the patent system as an uh, institutional issue or problem. I don't know if that's something you might want to address <laughs> at some point, but I'm, they're buzzing out in the hallway about that. But one of the points that, that uh, Dick Elkus makes 
is that all inventions grow out of an infrastructure of knowledge and of, of development that's grown over time, that there is no really such thing as a revolutionary innovation, that all innovation is in fact evolutionary. Uh, and that they grow out, that it grows out of a system of interrelated and interdependent and integrated parts uh, and that that integration and interrelationship uh, intensifies uh, over time. Simply to quote him, he says, as end-use markets and products and related technologies evolve, they become increasingly interrelated, interdependent, and integrated. One of the examples that he uses was uh, a 1990s uh, experiment by Ford Motor Company in which they disassembled a Lexus in order to see how it was put together. And one of the persons involved in that process said that it was a kind of car that they couldn't really design at Ford Motor Company because it was so integrated, uh, that it was an integrated system. Information systems, brakes, control mechanisms were all designed to make uh, the driver in the in the vehicle uh, an integrated system, uh, whereas uh, uh, in America they were add-ons and they were not a part of, of the integration. Or another example that I'm sure has been studied more thoroughly in business schools is why did Kodak not make the digital uh, transition? Uh, and he would answer that, that because Japan had a lead in all aspects of electronic technology, uh, it was better prepared and had the capacity for the digital evolution, the display panels, high definition uh, panels, uh, television, camcorders, uh, the VCR, and so forth, all of which came before the creation ultimately the digital camera, but the digital camera grew out of that. Uh, so that it wasn't simply that Kodak was behind the pitch, it was also that the infrastructure, the system of innovation was in place in Japan that enabled it to make the transition to, to digital cameras much more readily uh, than, than, um, than, uh, than Kodak was able to. His point is that manufacturing leads to innovation that the process of manufacturing is integral to the process of innovation and that in losing our manufacturing base in much of the uh, electronic technology, uh, we also lost the foundation upon which a great deal of innovation uh, grows, uh, grows. So uh, I would say that one obstacle is the recognition that innovation grows out of a, a more complete and integrated system. A second uh, obstacle is the emphasis in our economic system, at least in the last several decades, of short-term returns. And this has many sources. It has uh, increased competition, the changing basis of investment. We're all investors. If you go back 50 years, very few people own stock. Uh, the the, the uh, agalopolis that existed. Um, people saved in banks and so forth, but they didn't invest in stocks. And today we all have 401ks, as we're painfully aware, uh, so that this changes the dynamics of investment and investment strategy and long-term investment uh, is, is uh, n not something that's cultivated. Uh, and R&D costs and long-term risks that are taken in the investment in things like Bell Laboratories that didn't have an immediate return uh, by industry uh, have disappeared. A third uh, obstacle I would define as a political aver aversion to industrial policy. The belief in the free market, uh, the repudiation of government involvement, uh, that uh, suggests that something like industrial policy is something like a five-year plan or a planned economy. Um, however, we do have industrial policy. 
the breakup of AT&T was uh, certainly a part of an industrial policy. Every law that relates to the regulation of business, every tax code uh, is an industrial policy. Um, and so one could ask the question, does our tax code, for example, encourage short-term investment, long-term investment? I gather you talked this morning about SBIR. That is a part of an, of a, of an industrial policy. But we do, what we don't have, it seems to me, because in part of our emphasis upon um, the, the, the free market, uh, and of, uh, of our intense individualism is a coherent strategy for innovations. What technologies are essential for a competitive future? What technologies will form the foundation for future invention and future products? Uh, you've talked about energy and you've talked about uh, the environmental uh, aspects of what technologies may be yielding for the future. That kind of, um, of, a, of a green world. What technologies require what investment in infrastructure and what infrastructure and what is the role of government? All of these questions, it seems to me, are ones that need to be asked and we have at least over the last few years been reluctant to ask them. If one takes a look, for example, at what is required to become a life scientist these days, uh, the average age at which a life scientist receives their first R01 grant from NIH is age 42. Uh, that is a, a long period of apprenticeship. Uh, from a PhD through several postdocs uh, and into an assistant professorship and age 42 before you get your first independent grant uh, if you're lucky. Um, that's a discouraging, uh, certainly, prospect for young people who see very fast turnaround with an MBA and the capacity to, or recent capacity, to go to Wall Street. Uh, when strategies for education and strategies for industry combine, we get a reinforced combination, as we got after Sputnik. Um, I suppose the basic oh, that works. the basic comparative point is the centrality that other countries and other economies place on innovation itself. <coughs> innovation policy is visible, it's uh, valued, um, whether it's followed through in practice is another, is another issue. And in a way, in many cases, the situation is the reverse of what, what uh, Fred and Matt have pointed out in their paper, where the institutions in many cases in the US are there, but uh, the public awareness and even legislative policy awareness isn't there. In many cases around the world, innovation is elevated to uh, you know, as a, a major policy priority the institutions have yet to follow. Uh, but there are interesting things uh, going on. So the first, I suppose, couple of points here, the role of the state in supporting research should also put in supporting education, which is possibly the most fundamental of all of these, uh, of all of the policies here. Uh, supporting research, we get uh, Scandinavian countries, for example, increasing their spending on research. Uh, countries like China, in particular, making particularly rapid increases in research spending. Um, and some of that is going into government labs, like ITRI in Taiwan and so on, but an increasing proportion of it is channeled in through higher education. And generally speaking, across the OECD, spending on higher, uh, higher education, research and development as a percentage of GDP has been increasing. Um, and most of that initiative uh, is, is led, in, at least in, in, in many cases, certainly in uh, the Scandinavian countries, in China, in Ireland, Israel, and so on, uh, countries where there's a lot of action around innovation policy by, by the state. A second dimension is channeling finance towards innovation and upgrading. So we see, for example, in the Israeli case where we've had an explosion in the number of high-tech companies, the creation of the venture capital industry through state-created funds, and the Yozma scheme in particular. Uh, in Ireland where venture capital, the, the initial 
impetus for venture capital funds in the late 1990s came through state funds funding other private sector funds on a matching funds basis. Um, it was only after the boom had taken off in 98, 99 that private sector funding came in, disappeared again, 2001, and the state has come back in with an increased, uh, increased role since then again. So what's interesting there, I think, is in terms of looking at the, our earlier discussion about risk and entrepreneurialism is that at these stages where the very formation of the inputs into the production function, if you like, are, is, is at stake, capital, uh, education, research, the state is the key risk taker. The state isn't going anywhere. Entrepreneurs have, uh, have, uh, have other opportunities. So the key risk taker in these countries is, is the state. Um, the second couple of points that are under development relate to something a little different, and they build on the insight in uh, Andrew Schrank and Josh Whitford's paper, and uh, Fred referred to it earlier, about network failures. What makes networks among firms fail? And two key problems, one is lack of trust, the other is lack of confidence. Firms need to build up uh, their skills in, in, basic, uh, in, in the basic organizational skills, but also in networking with one another. And if we look across cases like Israel, Ireland, uh, Finland, we find state agencies engaged with small firms uh, and doing a list of things that are, is very, very similar to the list that Nicole put up about the Center for Entrepreneurship at uh, UC Davis. I mean, essentially, it's the same <laughs> list. Um, and it's, the guts of what they're doing is taking people with good technical ideas and technical experience, uh, technical expertise, and building an organizational shell and a, a structure of competences around that. And then it goes beyond that in terms of networking schemes, and we see an increase in uh, Scandinavian countries, uh, in Ireland, in Israel, and so on, in building these kind of ties between firms. Um, a lot of it quite informally through mentorship schemes, uh, through uh, institutional, interinstitutional ties, particularly between higher education and industry, and uh, also, but also in terms of trade associations, professional associations, and so on. In many cases, you find state funding for these kinds of uh, associations. Well, one thing I think that's different this time around is that employment relations are quite different. Uh, than the debate we had uh, during the 1990s, early 90s. And the way I put it is the fate of U.S. workers no longer figures in corporate decision making, right? And you see this uh, manifest in a lot of different ways. Uh, you know, for example, Craig Barrett saying that Intel can succeed without ever hiring another American. Um, but if you think about the compensation of CEOs and management, it's not based on how many U.S. workers they have, right? It's really based on earnings to share price and so on and so forth. And they're not going to treat their U.S. workers any differently or any better or worse than their Indian or European workers and so on and so forth. So the goal of the corporation is, is not really to create U.S. jobs, nor is it really tied as, as closely to the American economy. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and you see this also where IBM CEO Sam Palmasano, you know, had this sort of manifesto of the globally integrated enterprise. He published it in Foreign Affairs, talking about the disconnect between markets that they, that IBM and other globally integrated enterprises would sell into and where they actually do the production, where they have the jobs and the facilities and so on and so forth. Um, and the way I read at least that manifesto was that this was a major shift in the way that IBM and other corporate leaders viewed their role uh, within national economies and within the global economy. What's also new and interesting about this round of globalization is that low-cost countries have been able to attract R&D and innovation, right? This is a different narrative than what we've gotten in the past, which was what? You start with discrete part manufacturing, you move your way up into more complex tasks, and then you move up to higher value added, and uh, Ireland would be probably a pretty good case study of that, of moving upstream. What's interesting about it is, and R&D site selection experts say this, is what's new is that India and China, what we think of still as really third world countries, uh, are able to attract uh, new investments in R&D and innovation. And that sort of confounds that traditional narrative that we've had. Um, what's also new, I think, in this round is that there's a lot of uncertainty for particularly science and engineering workers and students about future opportunities. 
Uh, in the 1980s, we could tell blue-collar workers, look, go get retrained. And what would you get retrained in is IT, right? We heard uh, earlier a question about IT workers being laid off. You know, now where do you send them? Do you send them to the finance? Of course, we've, we've had that joke already earlier today. Um, but you also look at, for example, what Alan Blinder did, which was look at all 838 occupations and look at the vulnerability to offshoring. What's interesting about that study, and it's a speculative study, is that most of STEM occupations, science and engineering and mathematics occupations, are actually vulnerable to being offshore. So that creates a lot of uncertainty. So when people stand up and say, why aren't students going into science and engineering or computer science? Well, aren't they making somewhat rational choices here, right? In the sense that there's a lot of uncertainty about what the future may uh, bring. What happens to the downstream benefits of these R&D investments that taxpayers are being asked to pay for? Uh, do those uh, downstream benefits become less geographically sticky, right? Um, and you know, the goal of these R&D investments is not to create research jobs, although somebody mentioned 50,000 research jobs in Maryland. The idea is when, when my tax dollars in New York State go to Albany, to SUNY Albany, to fund that nanoscience center, it's not for funding the professors there or the researchers there. It's for the hope that the startup companies will come out of there and that there will be downstream jobs created out of that. To what extent does do that, does that norm that we have, that this idea that things are, uh, that you have this localized geographical spillover benefit, does that become more leaky as we've got these network effects and whatnot? What I'd also say, which again, I, I don't think has been discussed enough, is that the politics of all of this are very different from the 1980s. What's good for America may not be good for IBM and vice versa, but you better believe that all of those companies have a very strong influence on the policy and the political process, right? And they're going to ensure that policies that go through are going to be palatable to their uh, interest. I would also say that university lobbyists have been largely in lockstep with the companies. We heard one, maybe one area where there's some disagreement about Pi Dole, but by and large in this round of the discussion, uh, they've been pretty much in lockstep supporting the diagnosis and whatnot. And the, the potential countervailing force here, which are U.S. workers, really been politically impotent. Um, labor unions represent 7.5% of the private sector workforce, and it's been declining. Uh, and in the technology sector, it's even less. Uh, the professional societies who could play a role are globalizing themselves. Organizations like IEEE, which I'm quite active in, uh, see beachheads in China and India and don't want to mess up those opportunities there. Now let me show you a couple of actual uh, announcements, and I think a lot of that data is kind of backward looking. If you look forward to what announcements are being made by major R&D spenders like Microsoft, and the numbers here, number five means they're the number five U.S.-based uh, R&D spender. They spend about $7 billion in FY07. Uh, in India, they've got 4,000 workers, but if you look at what's going on in their R&D, their R&D center was established in 1998. They had 120 people by 2003. Uh, they have 1,500 plus workers by 2008. They're growing their workforce in R&D very significantly there. In China, <clears throat> their R&D group is a little bit older, 10 years, and they have 1,500 workers serving both local as well as global markets. Um, and they've made two major announcements in this year, in 2008, to expand uh, their R&D investments very significantly. Now, the point here is not that they're going to take most of Microsoft's R&D or most of Microsoft's R&D is going to go to China, but it's an indication that China has the capability of absorbing those mid-level jobs too, right? That it has the technical capabilities and, and those may become more footloose. Similarly, Intel, and I'll wrap this up very quickly, uh, in India, established an R&D center in 1998, they have 2,500 R&D workers there now. Uh, so that's in 10 years, and they're doing some significant stuff, including the first uh, all-India design chip, the, the Xeon 7400 microprocessor. Now, we know very little about what's going on here. In large part, I think it's because the companies really don't want to talk about this very much. I think the atmosphere is such that, uh, that they don't feel comfortable in talking about that, and I think that's a shame. And we, The more we know about the types of jobs that are going overseas, what's going to be sticky, that gives us a better sense of what we should be concentrating on and investing in.
sort of advantageous for me to be the last speaker because I have the privilege of taking copious notes and trying to kind of fit my discussion into what's been dis what's been already covered. Uh, and I want to thank Fred. Uh, this has been well worth my time today, just sitting here and hearing from the various speakers and some of the questions raised. I am a forever optimist. So while we've heard lots of discussions about what is or what can we do with our system and all the various uh, problems that are occurring, some of which we can't control because companies are going to do what's in their best interest to make profits. And while we, I agree with you, we need to have those discussions, uh, I suspect I'm not going to change IBM or Intel as it moves to new markets and where it sees its best application. But I want to spend a little bit of time talking about this new program because I think in many respects some of the things we've talked about this afternoon, this program has the capability of embodying some of the discussion that Fred had about this integrated collaborations, more support in terms of where universities can play a key role. And one thing that was sort of missing from the discussions today, I'm going to bring it in, is states. Because I'm a true believer that a lot of the uh, economies of scale and doing cluster analysis outside of what Victor said, that is only Boston and California and everybody else doesn't count, I totally disagree with that. I can point to you certain states that you wouldn't even be aware of where there's an influx of patents, and my former program did a lot of investigation in that. So I really want you to focus on it's a statutory language because there are certain policy changes that occurred as a result of this program. One, no longer can large companies get investments from the federal government. They can participate in this program, but it's just focused primarily at, at uh, small and medium-sized companies. Number two, for the first time, uh, TIP is looking for an ability to work more closely with universities, and we're still in the process of fin finishing up this competition, but I can tell you there's a paradigm shift. Fifty percent of our investments are going in joint partnerships with universities and small, medium-sized companies. And there's a lot of gold out there that I see occurring as a result of this new program. National labs can participate with the exception of the National Institute of Standards and Technology, nonprofit research labs as well. And we're still interested in advancing early-stage high-risk research. Um, I would be more damning to what Victor was telling you about. There's about 4,800 VCs in this country. I just sort of report there's going to be less than 1,100 after what we're going through right now. And they are risk adverse. So this is a policy implication. I'm a firm believer in public-private partnerships because I truly believe that there is an appropriate but limited role for the government to play. So we're going to be investing in early stage high-risk research and basic research. But here's the strange quirk to this. No longer, as in the previous program, are we interested in every technology. My research, my investments are going to be based on the nation's critical national needs. And I'll kind of quickly go through what that means in a second, but, in, but literally ours are going to be focused competitions, meeting areas where no other uh, federal mission agency or national lab is doing significant research, where industry seems to have a great interest and universities seem to have pockets of research. So it's going to be very targeted into specialized subtopic areas. And with the benefit of about 17 years of experience doing work uh, in the former program, uh, we think we can make a, a significant difference to the, uh, to the economy of our country. These are sort of the special criteria, and I'm not going to run through all of them. And you'll see shortly the definition of a critical national need. But in every new program, there's wonderful buzzwords. So in this program, it's transformational. And let me just sort of tell you what I think that means. That means disruptive technologies. I'm not interested in a short little benefit. I want to see something that absolutely changes the way in which our country, with its capabilities, can lead the, the marketplace, even if it's for just 18 months. Uh, we saw that in the previous program, where we invested in uh, DNA diagnostic tools. Uh, the ATP program actually created that industry, and one of our best uh, investments was Affymetrics. We identified the cause. We talked to Dr. Francis Collins at NIH. He was working on the genome at that time, and we said, how about gene sequencing? It doesn't exist. What do you think? And he said, I will give you everybody I can to detail to review these if you'll begin there, because when I finish the genome, it'll take me forever to do the science involved in doing the research. So critical national need. I don't have to read it to you, but what really we're focusing this program on is what justifies the government to even get involved? And why this is more appetizing to the conservatives, and I don't want to mention industrial policy, 
But this passed the test because this was written into the statute that the President and the current administration agreed with was we have to determine that if we don't fund in a particular area, it is of such national importance, it would lead to lots of disastrous uh, situations. So, as defined here, it has to be of such critical importance that if, in fact, we didn't fund it, it would be um, it would be of serious concern to our country. And further defined is the societal challenge. So the companies that apply have to be able to tell us what this problem or issue is and what the challenge is and why this represents a significant change in increasing the state of the art. And in yellow, you notice here, this program is not going to be funding just technology. It's on the needs, the critical national needs of the country. I think what this does from a policy perspective is it completely changes the focus of why we should be in existence. And I'm hoping after long years of fighting that, that that, that will occur. Okay, first investment was this year. I've heard people talk about infrastructure. Even, bef even after the Minneapolis situation, um, we went through a long process of dealing with the National Academy of Engineering, National Academy of Sciences, STIPI, that does report work for the uh, Office of Science Technology Policy, talked to industry, went to some incredibly leading universities in this field, and then prepared various documentation as to where we thought the critical national needs might be. This one came up to number one. This is a huge problem. It's about $7.1 trillion cost to all the states. There hasn't been really significant work done here since the Romans built bridges. And so we're talking about remote sensing that could even be powered by the sun that reports back to designated spots where there are infrastructure issues. This is just the first year of this funding. It also deals with water. We lose in this country six billion gallons a day of undisclosed breakage in the pipes, and we have no idea where they're going to occur. So this program will be initially doing this work, where I think this program will eventually lead is where NIST is not a regulatory body. If, in fact, we break out companies in this area, and clearly there's a market overseas, I could envision, for example, the Federal Highway Administration dictating not who to buy from, but to say when you build future bridges, you must incorporate super concrete, nanomaterials within the bridges, or remote sensing so that we can reduce the burden to our citizens who may wind up like that person on the bridge and not making it home, much less losing their life, including the loss of, um, of um, interstate commerce. My last points I want to make is this program is very interested in doing this gap analysis. So what you see listed here are critical areas, obviously some of we've already talked about, that we believe are underfunded currently in the government, that there's a crying need for more collaboration with industry, and that the universities are willing to also get involved here because their professors and their postdocs are telling us they're doing incredible research here. Each one of these topics is not just simply manufacturing. It could be biomanufacturing. Energy, it could be algae, but it could be wind, solar, geothermal, um, uh, the turbines, the energy storage that you heard about earlier. What do we do when we can't, we well, have to store that energy? A lot of problems here. Fuel cells, for example. Personalized medicine, I could probably spend an hour talking to you about where we have to go here. But I will tell you the other thing that this program is doing, which is very unique. We are working with our brothers and sisters across the federal agencies. And this little program just had major talks with DOE. And instead of them literally blowing us off, they said, we would love to work with you. We're doing X. We're going to have meetings with you about where we see we're not getting the kind of research we want. And that could be part of your gap analysis as to where you will go. And then together, we'll work in future applied research and funding. So what I'm trying to do is move this program to a synergistic relationship with a lot of the agencies. We're going to be having talks with FDA, EPA. I do believe this program can help reduce clinical trials in getting new pharmaceuticals to this uh, to this needed citizens. Today it's about $1.5 billion to bring a drug to the market. I think there's new ways in which this program can make investments working with NIH, working with FDA to improve those. And I'll end with funding. For some reason, while I don't know exactly what's going to happen, let's just suggest that this program is under the watchful eye of the new administration, and I can't wait to see what that might mean. <laughs> Thank you.